Hi everyone. Uh, today I'm Nena Farga, founder editor at the Philosophy Project. is very delighted to host our first online lecture series on rethinking Indian jurisprudence with the professor and author uh, uh, Akash Singh Rathod. So a brief introduction about uh, um, so. So he is a very truly a versatile man, and I'm following his work since a long time. So he's a professor, author, philosopher, and an iron triathlete. He has taught at many universities, University of Delhi, Bombay, Hyderabad, Rautus, Venezuela in USA, Toronto in Canada, Humboldt University in Berlin, among others. He has authored 18 books ranging from political philosophy, law, religion, to literature. Some of his books, including Ambedkar's Preamble, Plato's Labyrinth, Dalit Feminism, Dalit Feminist Theory, and Rethinking uh, Indian Jurisprudence. Despite his uh, prolic uh, prolific uh, writer, writing, Professor engages regularly at several civil societies and community, and he's a regular contributor at several newspapers and blogs, international blogs. So today, it's a complete pleasure for us to host you, sir, with this. I would really like to thank Professor Rathor to agreeing to be with us for here today. So before, uh, so like, it would be really great to hear, sir, today. So over to you, Professor. All right, um, please check the network. Ne okay, so I've got a network notice. I hope you're able to hear me and uh, the connection is okay. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. So uh, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, unfortunately, suddenly my, the amount of time I have available has shrunk to just one hour. I hope we can have a conversation, discussion within that time that is still worth everybody's uh, while. Uh, so I, um, I was asked to speak on uh, this book, uh, which uh, I don't know if it comes up in reverse when I hold it up, uh, Rethinking Indian Jurisprudence, uh, which is subtitled An Introduction to the Philosophy of Law. The book is actually, um, it's actually part of a, uh, of a four book series. So uh, long time ago when I was teaching at JNU, uh, I was teaching a course on the philosophy of social science. And uh, uh, around that time, I realized that social sciences in India are suffering from a number of problems uh, that have been well characterized uh, in certain respects. For example, uh, uh, Gopal Guru has inaugurated a very important discussion on the inegalitarian nature of the Indian social sciences. Feminists have argued about the sort of hyper-masculine nature of uh, academic social sciences in India. Um, and so we know from certain marginalized groups how uh, the social sciences in India are very uh, mainstream, uh, so-called upper caste, hegemonic, and patriarchal. But that's not all that our social sciences suffer from. Uh, in addition, they suffer from uh, being um, uh, self-contradictory in the sense that the origin of the social sciences things like uh, political science or uh, sociology. Um, the origin of these uh, sciences was to, uh, to, to, um, to gather empirical information from uh, the, the, the social realities um, present in the places where these Sciences, social sciences are being conducted, and then use, sift through the, the empirical information, refine your findings, and then generate theories that are not merely of academic interest, but that are uh, socially and politically useful. In fact, the earliest social sciences in the UK, um, the, the UK model, there are a few different models. The German model is different, but let's say the, the, the British mo model, which of course India and the United States follow. Um, in this model, the social sciences were 
exercised primarily by administrative uh, administrators uh, in order to determine how to uh, rule uh, various populations um, more successfully. So in other words, we, we have great uh, institutions such as SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in, uh, in England, and the whole function of this university, which is of course a top social science university in the world uh, today, the whole function of this university several centuries ago was precisely to train uh, British administrative officers on how to rule the, uh, the empire uh, effectively. So in order to rule the empire, you need knowledge about the, the, the target uh, people. So let's say it's India. Um, this is why if anyone wants to study South Asia today, South Asian history, South Asian uh, philosophy, South Asian uh, politics, South Asian ethnography, anything, one still goes to, to SOAS uh, to do so. All of these aspects of, in this particular case, Indian uh, cultural civilizational history were grouped up into different disciplines and fields in order to be mastered by these administrators so that the uh, knowledge generated was useful to the state for controlling, um, for controlling the empire. Now, why I mention this is that if you look at this historical context, where the social sciences come from, um, the fact that they would be um, consistently uh, um, marginalizing, the fact that they would be uh, exclusive exclude people, different diverse persons of various backgrounds, it seems almost uh, 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 inevitable. But one thing that should not be inevitable is that within a state like India, the social sciences would be conducted in a manner that has almost no utility uh, to uh, uh, social or political um, uh, uh, advancement. Uh, and it goes so far that that the sorts of empirical data that we study uh, in the social sciences in India are mismatched with the theoretical um, uh, applications that are consistently taught to, uh, to students at universities, central universities and colleges all over India. So I said that in a little bit complicated way, but let me say it a little simpler. On the one hand, the origin of the social sciences um, throughout much of the world was to generate, to, to discover uh, and generate knowledge that was useful socially and politically. In India, we, we generate, uh, uh, the, the social sciences uh, uh, seem to be in an awkward position of consisting of theories that are not created by the social and political realities but instead theories that were that are borrowed from other social and political realities and then reapplying them to the Indian situation so that, for example, if we are going to study, uh, uh, let's say, something like caste in India, um, instead of having indigenous concepts about the nature, origins, structure, function, and future of caste, um, we will adopt terms like ethnicity, uh, a term from an, an entirely uh, different discourse that may or may not be at all relevant uh, in India. So why would we use the word ethnicity when we're discussing castes in India? Because there's already a discourse, a vibrant sort of international discussion about ethnicity that comes from other parts of the world, especially South America and uh, uh, Europe, and in order to be able to borrow theories from uh, places like American universities, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use uh, a term like ethnicity so that once we start using the term ethnicity, we can bring along with that term all of the pre-made, pre-packaged theories that are then available to us to sound very intellectual uh, in India when talking about something such as uh, caste, even though no one has done the prior research to determine whether caste and ethnicity are in any way analogous uh, at all. 
So uh, I noticed this problem at uh, JNU many years ago, and, and I realized that uh, since the problem is so complex and covers many different uh, disciplines and it covers many different uh, sort of um, uh, ident uh, problems with uh, identity, so those who are marginalized from the discourse, that I couldn't just write one book about it. So, um, so I planned uh, four books on it. And the first book was uh, called Indian Political Theory. I don't think I have a copy of it here. Uh, Indian Political Theory, which is a kind of critique of the way political theory or political science is done in India, in Indian universities. And I argued that uh, the way that um, we think about political science in India is, uh, suffers from this very same irony I just described about social sciences, which is, um, which is that the theories are all imported and the realities are all uh, local. And we have this mismatch or disconnect between uh, imported theories and the local realities. And it's this mismatch that makes us say rather ridiculous things um, in uh, Indian academic or, or casual circumstances, like I'm sure all of you hear all the time that India is so complicated. It's a, such a complicated society. Well, uh, anything is complicated if you don't have the concepts to understand it. Um, and the reason that Indian society continues to seem so complicated to Indian academics and of course, foreign academics is because we use only foreign concepts in order to understand Indian realities. So if we were to um, start using uh, a host of, let's say, um, local cultural terms from I don't know, uh, badminton. I suppose some of you play badminton. So let's say we use all of the vocabulary of badminton and start to explain uh, water polo according to uh, the concepts of badminton. Um, I don't think water plays a very big part in, in badminton. So from the start, we realize how, uh, how many absurdities this would result in if the entire vocabulary I have to describe a, a, a game of water polo is um, coming from uh, and only from badminton. And so this is what we have in Indian political science. We have um, a case where all of our concepts are imported and the local situation um, is unable to be um, uh, sort of uniformly and coherently clicked to these uh, foreign concepts. And as a result, we get something like a totally obfuscated situation. So nobody understands what's going on. No one else knows how to describe it. And instead of saying it's a failure of our concepts, we say it's a failure of the realities. The Indian reality is too complex. Uh, we have too much identity politics. We have too much uh, caste politics there. There's too much discontent. All of these things because we don't have a language to capture it properly. So if that's true in political science. I realized it's also true in uh, law. And uh, uh, so that's why then I wrote uh, the second book, Rethinking Indian Jurisprudence. So if the first book was like Rethinking Indian Political Theory, this is on Rethinking Indian Jurisprudence. And so um, before I come to its uh, content more clearly, um, I'll just jump ahead to the, the next two books um, in the series. The third one um, Naina had mentioned is Dalit Feminist Theory. And this was an intervention into uh, feminism in India, where the, the orientation uh, one observes with uh, mainstream feminism is to neglect um, the, uh, uh, the the social situation of the majority of uh, of uh, of of, um, of uh, uh, female persons in India. So we have an, the articulation of a feminist theory again, theory standing atop. Uh, the empirical content, the um, everyday ordinary activities and events. The theory is articulated by uh, primarily um, elite uh, uh, socially advantaged uh, women who then have to discuss the social realities of patriarchy and uh, misogyny and masculinity and so on uh, within India. And uh, yet, uh, given that around 85% of uh, Indian women are from various marginalized communities, what they have to say, what they have to articulate, since it doesn't conform to the elite 
discourse, the elite way of describing uh, ground realities, which again are borrowed from, from the West, uh, their voices remain un, unheard. So, uh, so we can see the same problem in political science, we see it in law, we can see it within the uh, domain of uh, feminist uh, philosophy. And then the fourth book um, is, uh, uh, I'm still writing, it's called Structure and Agency in the Indian Social Sciences. So it's finally the culmination of the critique about how we do social sciences uh, or uh, how we do versus how we ought to do social sciences in, in India. So within that four book structure, um, there's this, uh, this uh, book about rethinking Indian jurisprudence. And I spent time describing the overall project so that you could see how the things that I say about uh, jurisprudence um, in some respects are already um, predicted by what I said about political theory. So where do our jurisprudential ideas uh, come from? Where do our uh, concepts uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that dominate uh, juristic thinking in law, where do these uh, derive? And yet, what are they being applied to? What sort of social uh, phenomena are they being applied to? And is there a consistency or an inconsistency in the juridical concepts that we have uh, and the, um, and the uh, legal realities that we're attempting to address. And in the process, are we not doing um, uh, various sorts of um, exclusion in the uh, process? Because um, once again, uh, the voices of marginalized persons then have to be translated into this elite juristical language if, um, if they are to be coherent in our legal uh, system. That means that ordinary everyday people in their vernaculars cannot articulate themselves within a legal framework and have it be valid unless and until that is translated into the uh, legalese uh, language, which language was uh, imported and imposed from, uh, from outside. So the, um, the way that, uh, that I talk about how to rethink Indian jurisprudence um, is, uh, is um, well, quite frankly, is, is dangerous. It's dangerous because when we, when we create dualisms to juxtapose things like indigenous versus uh, foreign or alien or external, that we're creating an us and them, a, a binary that pits uh, you know, friend against foe identity versus other identity and so on. So we have to be consciously uh, uh, cautious about this binary that gets constructed. And the, the basic way that the arguments that I'm making in these four books that I described to you, the basic way this has been articulated for the last hundred years in India is an um, Indian versus Western. And uh, and this is an extremely dangerous um, way of viewing things. It's also an erroneous way of doing things because we look at the case of political theory and our universities. So the subject of the first book, Indian Political Theory. What we see is that our universities are not uh, madrasas. They're not gurukuls. Uh, they're not uh, uh, various uh, other formations of uh, kind of academic uh, institutions. They are universities according to the, um, the basic uh, British model or European model of the university. And consequently, the knowledge that is considered valid within that structure, on the one hand, might not be valid knowledge in another structure, like a madrasa or a gurukul. And on the other hand, the knowledge structures in a madrasa or a gurukul or what, whatever might not be um, uh, valid within the academic university system, uh, the European university system. So if we are aware that we're in university systems that were conceptualized and evolved uh, in Europe and then transplanted to India, then really what's the problem? Why shouldn't we? Um, just uh, follow all of that uh, vocabulary. Why do we call it foreign? It's already here 
on Indian soil. All of our central universities are according to this model, except for the um, 11 Sanskrit universities that we have. And maybe you didn't know that there are 11 Sanskrit universities, uh, central universities, and, um, and uh, that's a little weird, right? <laughs> the fact that, that, you know, there are only about, what, 40, 46 or something central universities, 11 of them are uh, Sanskrit universities that none of us ever hear about um, because essentially they're just reserved institutions for a social elite um, paid by our uh, tax uh, dollars, tax uh, rupees, and, um, and producing no uh, uh, knowledge valuable for, for uh, broader social life. Anyway, put those Sanskrit universities that none of us has ever heard of uh, aside, and we're dealing with uh, basically European university system on Indian soil. So why shouldn't we have these European concepts then? The reason is because the concepts are meant to explain or enlighten the, the realities of that soil. And that is especially true in a, a juridical circumstance, in a system of laws, a judiciary, um, uh, a bar association, and all of these things. If the, the the legal circumstances that are being um, uh, that are playing out uh, within India are played out by uh, Indians within a vernacular uh, uh, languages and lifestyles. Then to 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 suddenly um, uh, uh, denude them, strip them of all of their um, uh, character and qualities, and bring them into this bizarre institution. You know, it's so bizarre that it's not long ago when the white wigs uh, were mandatory and we still wear the, these black uh, robes. Any of you who are uh, lawyers, I mean, know that this, um, this kind of suit does not suit our, um, our uh, climate. And uh, yet today, every day, there are uh, 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 thousands and thousands of, of of lawyers throughout India in 40, 45 degrees, um, uh, dressed up in, in black suits. I mean, it's, it's completely absurd. So these sorts of absurdities are just, they're not very relevant, but they're sort of symbolic of how the whole system works. Now, um, uh, so the idea is we have to rethink it then, but if we rethink it and we start championing this sort of indigeneity, then we lock ourselves into a hundred year old battle of that uh, uh, indigenous or native versus uh, Western. And that is a battle that has been um, uh, fought very badly and uh, with um, very little foresight because when one starts to create an us and them, then we need certain rules about who the us are. And that in turn leads into the identity politics that we uh, uh, find ourselves trapped in because we have to start defining who is the us. Now, I just misspoke a little while ago and I said by our US tax dollars, or I said by our tax dollars. Um, that's because I've been following the US election so closely and um, what's going on uh, with, in the courts there. Um, but also because I was um, uh, raised uh, in the United States. So, um, uh, uh, although I live in, have lived in India for, for many years, um, the idea is, do I then qualify as an us or am I a them? So we see already in the dualism or in cases, personal cases like, like mine, um, that we have a problem of who fits. And so we have to discuss what are the criteria for fitting. Now, um, uh, on the one hand, it would seem to be easy because we have things like citizenship laws. But on the other hand, each of you who knows what has been going on in India knows the highly volatile and political nature of citizenship laws as we can see through citizenship amendment. Um, so what's going on is that we're defining the us, not in terms of something that is merely legally practical, but in terms of something that is politically volatile. And the politics of it comes about, let's put it in a very simple uh, uh, picture, it comes about because, for example, we're an allegedly 
dominant Hindu uh, country in India. Now I say allegedly because I don't think anyone really understands what this concept Hindu means. It's just a pop uh, concept that anyone who studies it uh, understands as it's itself a collection of fractured um, uh, practices and, and, and uh, theologies. But anyway, the way that we call it in ordinary language is a Hindu majority nation. And in that sense, when we start having the us and them, like we had 100 years ago in the, um, uh, in the uh, freedom struggle, national struggle, one thing that obviously happened was trying to decide if the British were invaders and we want to go back to some Swaraj era, some era of um, uh, self-rule and uh, autonomy, um, then does that include Muslims or does it not include Muslims? Does it include Christians, Indian Christians, or does not include Indian Christians? And so the, there's a bit of a mess when we start trying to think about the us, the identity part. And that part of that uh, uh, mess plays out with, uh, through identity politics, even in trying to figure out um, something that should be fairly straightforward, like citizenship. So the politics of us and them continues to plague us even when we try to figure out something as simple as um, uh, who are we? And so uh, the who are we then, this question, this, this sort of basic ontological question um, uh, is riddled not only with, um, with uh, communitarian and majoritarian um, uh, politics, but uh, also uh, with um, with uh, structured by history, so it's impossible for us to think about something in the ab pure and abstract way without realizing that history has shaped the way that we think about uh, everything. So when I talk about rethinking, then I hope I know I've been speaking very very abstractly, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, I hope that you get you're getting a sense of what I'm uh, the, the the larger portrait I'm trying to paint. Yes. Within, the, within the idea of rethinking Indian jurisprudence, these are the sorts of things that we have to rethink. Who are we? Um, what bearing does our history have upon us? And which era of history are we going to highlight and promote? What aspects of the freedom struggle or the hundred years battle um, between our forging an Indian identity over and against being... Um, uh, um, uh, under uh, subject to British rule. Um, which aspects of this battle do we bring forward and which aspects do we um, leave, leave uh, behind? And, uh, and all of these things have to be uh, um, thought along with the classical questions of marginalization, of, um, of uh, uh, gender equality, of um, of uh, 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 equality for 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 um, uh, uh, same sex uh, uh, orientations and and you know all of these other aspects that we routinely get into, we need to think about these social aspects from a lens that considers how we are um, uh, entrenched politically and historically in what we think are simply philosophical uh, questions. And, um, and uh, um, you know, so we get into the, the, the philosophical side of it. The very, the most basic question of law and the most basic question behind each of these four books that I described is I keep using this word Indian um, Indian political thought, rethinking Indian jurisprudence, Dalit feminist uh, theory and, and, and uh, structure and agency in the Indian social sciences. Well, what does it mean to be Indian? So that is the, the sort of a priori uh, uh, question when we think about uh, across law, philosophy, politics and sociology, history uh, within India. What does it even mean to be Indian? And, uh, and that is um, uh, equivalent to the basic or fundamental ontological 
question of who am I? And yet, when we ask that question, who, who am I? See, you can think of a Cartesian situation when Descartes was asking uh, what, uh, uh, what he is or, or what is. Um, he came up with this cogito idea. I think, therefore, I am. And so, so he asks, uh, you know, what is this uh, uh, I am? What is this thing that is thinking? And the way that this gets represented, for example, in your philosophy classes, uh, surely at Miranda House and, and other uh, uh, fine uh, colleges, the way that this gets represented is that this question is being posed irrespective of race, irrespective of religion, irrespective of gender, irrespective of uh, caste or class, and uh, irrespective of, uh, it, I don't remember if I said religion. So, uh, irrespective of all of these things, that one can simply ask oneself, uh, who am I, without uh, being embodied, uh, engendered, in a religious or social uh, 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 context. And this kind of um, myth, this, this, this ideal, has gotten carried forward from all the way back to this time in Descartes, to even things that we are taught today in political science, political theory, political philosophy, like John Rawls. So in John Rawls's idea about the basic structure of the, the just state, um, the, the entire uh, exercise is conducted in a so-called under a veil of ignorance, and um, or as in his later book, uh, from the original position. And what this position, original position is, is a position that is uh, without race, without gender, without caste, without class, without history, without um, uh, religion, and so on. Now, here's the issue. The issue is that in reality, in everyday reality, we are never without gender, or class, or history, or language, or religion. So when we live in the real world, these are the things that answer the question, who am I? They answer the question, what is the nature of the state? <clears throat> so when the political philosophers or the ontological philosophers <clears throat> like Descartes or John Rawls and so on, ask these questions from this position of purity, and then we continue to perpetuate this idea that this is how these questions are answered, we constantly avoid the reality of the situation. And the reality is, that when I ask myself, what am I? Some, the first things that emerge in my consciousness are, uh, of course, my gender, my caste, my class, my uh, religion, and so on. So how are we to harmonize the way that we are taught about the nature of law, the nature of reality, the nature of uh, identity, um, the nature of the state versus the realities of how law plays out, the realities of the state, the realities of politics, and the realities of history. And so since these things are so far apart, what we are taught academically and what our realities are, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's legal, whether it's <clears throat> identity-based, like having to do with gender and caste, we are essentially in a process of um, of learning through three years of college or five years if you do an MA or 10 years if you do a PhD, we're in a process of not learning about reality. We're in a process of <clears throat> altering our uh, uh, thought structure to force us to be incapable of seeing reality. And while this, um, um, while this has been going on for several, decades and people think things are, are, are fine, <laughs> um, it is really the, the legal system where we see how not fine things are. And this can be seen across um, the way that our courts are um, um, proceed without any coherent jurisprudential uh, principles. So there's an arbitrary nature to judicial decision making in India. That's one hand, the mind of the judiciary. It can be seen on the actual physical practices in the court. So the way that the marginalized remain marginalized, or it gets even more amplified when um, common people enter uh, 
district courts, circuit courts, how they're treated by the officers of the court with complete contempt. Um, and uh, and uh, most importantly, it, um, uh, uh, it is visible in the way that our system of laws and system of administration is completely incoherent and, and, and arbitrary. And we're supposed to have a rule of law, but what we get instead is a rule by administrators. And the rule by administrators is subject to the whim of administrators. Um, and it's subject to whims and fancies as opposed to being subject to jurisprudential regimes or philosophical principles. And why is that the case? Because as I've been talking for now 35 minutes, um, too long, sorry. Now I've been talking, what I've been talking about is that each of these ideas, jurisprudential regimes or philosophical principles are completely dissociated from our lived everyday uh, experiences, whether they are within the legal realm or the social realm or the political realm or, or anything else. And so what I'm trying to do in Rethinking Indian Jurisprudence is the same thing I'm trying to do in all of these collection of four books is address legal theorists, address political philosophers, address uh, social scientists, address uh, feminists and, um, and so on of the need, the urgent need to return back to what we call the things themselves. So return back to uh, the phenomena as they uh, reveal themselves prior to the way that we manipulate them with our uh, so-called educated minds. And uh, within uh, Indian law or the code of, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the system of Indian uh, uh, law and legal processes and the courts and so on, I don't think this is a, 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 a fantasy by any stretch of the imagination. The problem is that just as we as social scientists or philosophers or political scientists get miseducated as much as we get educated. So we get sort of told propaganda at the same time that we're told historical facts like about Cartesian meditations and so on. The fact that Descartes was a man, was a Christian, was an aristocrat, these are all important uh, things to the way that he thought and the things that he said. But we are told to ignore all of those things, that it's just a universal thought that this brilliant philosopher, irrespective of uh, religion and gender and so on, discovered. So that's not, that's not the, the way life works, as we all know. Thoughts are historically and materially conditioned. So in the legal system, all it would uh, require is a, a revamping of the way that uh, law is taught. And the first place, because it's a first year course in every law school in India, the first place we have to re start reorganizing the way that we think about law is in jurisprudence classes in Indian law schools. And so I wrote this book to try to wake up teachers of law and students of law of this need to rethink the way that we philosophically think about law so that we can start to uh, suture together our social realities with our abstract legal principles. And this is the thing that I seek to do in philosophy and political science, sociology, as well as law. Uh, and I hope I managed to explain to you how, um, what the problem is and uh, um, how it plays out and some steps to, um, uh, to correct it. I do apologize for speaking so abstractly today. It's hard to talk about four books <laughs> at once um, yes, uh, yes. without uh, getting a little abstract, but maybe we can sort it out in the Q&A. Thanks for your patience for listening. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, thank you so much, sir. It was really insightful. I would just like to ask the audience if they have any questions, they can either unmute themselves or type the questions in the chat box and we can take them up for you, whatever is convenient for everyone. Uh, so, okay, so before we start, I have one question. Like, this is one question that popped in my mind while I was reading about reading through the Rethinking Indian Jurisprudence. So, sir, 
how would the percept of decolonizing the jurisprudence would be actually like like what would be the modus operandi in that and the other follow up question with this is like it has been stated in raul's second principle that any change has to advantage the disadvantage so how the process of decolonize decolonization and like rethinking of this indian jurisprudence can be done by including people from uh, all the different all the people who are the disadvantaged one and the people from different sect of the society um yeah th so that's uh... so uh, actually my question i think that nana has phrased the question really very well but my question was just the more basic version of what nana has said that you know like as of now like how when i've been listening to you um i have gotten the idea what exists and what is right now and like we're not in a very good position right now but like how would uh, what is the future of this how do we uh, make our system like we're from an institution so what can we do to make things better for people who are disadvantaged for example what are the what is the advantage section also supposed to do to uh, make it better for them Okay great so what i what i see in your two questions is that they fit together one is sort of from the theoretical side and one is from the practical side so if theoretically i'm arguing that we need to decolonize um uh in indian jurisprudence and the indian social sciences and do so with the awareness of something like the difference principle um uh so this is all fine i could answer that from a theoretical point of view but the question then gets asked how do you do it practically um so i think that's that's fantastic uh, so just from the first part um uh, what i what i've done in indian political theory the first book uh which is subtitled laying the groundwork for swaraj what this means the swaraj concept is a concept of decolonizing the mind now um Uh, decolonizing the mind is an expression that comes from an african post colonial uh, writer um the idea is essentially this that that in the process of uh, colonization we we were not only uh, dominated um materially and physically but uh but also um, psychologically spiritually and mentally and so it's it's one thing to declare oneself a sovereign a free independent sovereign nation it's the other thing completely different to be that um psychologically uh, uh and spiritually and as i had mentioned for the last 100 years we've had this war this battle between um uh between indigeneity and let's say modernization in this case so we could say that um the, the the british this was how gandhi had represented it in hind swaraj and other writings that the west was using this so called um hoax of civilization to modernize india but what they were actually doing was destroying uh, uh committing a sort of uh epistemicide killing different kinds of uh, knowledge systems and cultural practices and, and things like this and so it became this idea of indigeneity versus um a uh, colonization or um uh, home rule versus uh, foreign rule now in this grouping what ends up happening for example you can see with um when uh, many times men uh see uh, feminism as a practice of uh, women so you create in the term feminism a, a artificial dualism between men and women but what we realize is that that means that any woman gets to speak on behalf of feminism and why should women get to speak on behalf of feminism when women are the ones who bear so much responsibility for patriarchy so just because you're a woman does not automatically entitle you to speak on behalf of feminism just uh um uh, uh uh just uh analogous to this uh, to this uh, issue is when you had an us and them an indigenous versus uh, the, the the colonizer you develop this it, it automatically introduced this priority and right for the indian educated elite generally upper caste and always male to speak on what it means to be indian so um uh this is why 
when we call people anti-national, for example, which is so prominent uh, today, the, the, when you break down what is the content, what does it mean to be anti-national, it means to, to, to vary from the hidden paradigm of a particular linguistic, uh, racial, gender, and religious community. And when you differ from that hidden paradigm, you are anti-national. What it means is that it's only this paradigm that is the nation because it is these people, the persons who occupy that, that uh, gender, class, status, and so on, who get to say what it means to be India just by virtue of historical accident. And so when we decolonize, we cannot do so with this dualism saying that you're the colonizer and we are the colonized and we get to speak on behalf of the colonized because we've been free for 70 years. And so who is colonizing us? We're, we're self-colonizing, right? But for the past 70 years, India has been a state of self-colonization. And the process of this self-colonization is a process where our own most exploitative aspects eat up and control and dominate uh, the, the, the whole of social uh, and political life. Just like when we were under uh, colonial rule, uh, the British could the, would dominate and eat up every aspect and, and plunder for themselves. Now it's the case that um, the people who get to occupy that position of being Indian, of being nationalists, uh, get to exploit and plunder and, and occupy all spaces. So to call it to decolonize does not mean to just become an an us and now, now that we're not uh, uh, British everything is fine. We have to decolonize from ourselves from our own internal colonial practices and those internal colonial practices are typified characteristically by two very strong features by patriarchy male domination and exploitation of uh, women and um, by uh, uh, caste uh, hierarchy. And so what it suggests is that the true decolonization is not becoming an Indian elite and saying, so now we're not British and we're in charge and we're decolonized. No, because that Indian elite is inevitably going to be uh, so-called high caste and, and patriarchal. Instead, to decolonize means decolonizing from the very principles at play with the exploitative process of colonization. And so since colonization is an exploitative, extractive legal, political, and social system, when we really decolonize, we're not just getting rid of white people, we're getting rid of those legal, political, and social practices um, uh, that constitute what it means to be uh, exploitative. So fine, in theory. How do you do it in practice? There are um, more or less uh, clues in the nature of colonization. So privilege from the vantage point of, um, of inherited status, um, status just given by luck. You know, it's just, uh, it's sheer luck that um, you know, someone like me happens to enjoy multiple um, uh, advantages. So I'm a male, uh, I'm so-called high caste, I'm uh, 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 from the dominant, I mean, I'm a Buddhist, but I was born into a, a Hindu family um, and I am uh, happen to be uh, heterosexual. So, you know, I, I what uh, uh, I was happen to be born into a family that gives me multiple privileges simultaneously. So, you know, I get all of these advantages. Now, what I do then is refer to all of the benefits of these advantages as my merit, right? <laughs> so um, even though um, they're all historical accident, the accumulation of all of the boons and benefits, um, I articulate as my merit. So, you know, aren't I uh, wonderful because I have achieved this and that? Well, obviously why I achieved this and that is largely, not entirely, but largely conditioned by the social circumstances that privilege someone who's a male, that privilege someone who's a so-called upper caste, that privilege someone who um, is uh, uh, seen as a Hindu and, and things like this. So how do we address this? What we do is we become aware of the ways that 
the social circumstances and contexts have put me in the um, in the place of uh, of plunder. So just like a British an English person born in the 18th century who walks through um, London as a middle class sees this magnificent city, right? And this magnificent city with all of its marble and these beautiful buildings and all of these things is of course, that person did nothing to, 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 to create it. He or she does things to sustain it, but it's essentially constructed by plundering the world. And so my, uh, it's, I was using myself as the, the, the case here. Uh, so when I realize that I'm, I'm quadruply advantaged in terms of caste, class, gender, uh, sexual orientation, religion, all of these things, I have to realize that my life is a life in some respects of plunder. It's a, it's a life of, uh, of privilege that, that, that uh, the, the, the sort of um, social uh, capital that I enjoy is, uh, is a social capital that was created by a system uh, of, um, of plunder, of extraction, of social inequality, of hierarchy and, and things like that. And so once you get that conscious awareness, you can start to apply it in different uh, particular circumstances. So it can be as mundane as I have plenty of money to give when I see that someone needs something. So working on um, raising tuition uh, fees for um, uh, poor uh, uh, students or something like that, um, that I have, uh, as you have all uh, launched this, um, uh, this webinar or this, uh, this series of, uh, of talks because you're in a position to do so. I'm not saying it's easy. You have to take a great deal of effort and I applaud you on that effort. At the same time, you can imagine uh, people back um, in another, you know, if you, if you have ancestral villages or whatever, you can imagine that there must be some woman you know, some auntie you know, that has ideas but has no capacity, no infrastructure for, for doing anything similar to what you are doing right now and not because of her own doing right? just because of social circumstances so when you when you when you put yourself in the awareness of the gifts that you have gotten just by luck by sheer luck then you try to give back um, some of those uh, things so you give back uh, financially you give back with your time when I was at teaching at Delhi University that was a long long time ago 2005, I started, um, um, just opened a, a tutoring center for, for students in English, uh, reading and writing, uh, primarily to help students who came uh, from uh, marginalized backgrounds to compete at the level of University of Delhi, because as you know from your own classes in Miranda House, I'm sure, and other colleges, that when you get someone who doesn't come from an English medium uh, background or uh, middle-class background, uh, they're perceived as being less intelligent when in fact, it's just a question of not having exposure to this uh, training. So start a tutoring center uh, and help people with their writing and bring them uh, up to uh, uh, expected standards. There are, you know, there are a million things that can be done, but the, the principle behind it is to understand basically luck egalitarianism that the, the inequalities that we see socially, we might not be perpetuating them on purpose, but we are certainly benefiting from, uh, from, from the system. And if we, if we um, adjust our awareness to this, then in our everyday dealings, we have much more likely to give back rather than just to continue to extract. I gave such a long answer. I hope, uh, I hope at least it was uh, clear. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Sure. Even it answers a lot of small questions that are coming in my mind. So yeah, your answer is perfectly, like really a helpful one. Thank you. Sir. Professor Tyagi has a question. Yeah. Um, Professor Nisha Tyagi. Okay, so, okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah, got my answer. Thank you, Professor Hatchwal. It was excellent. Thank you, Professor.
even like I had a kind of a follow up question to <clears throat> what we were discussing about, like uh, the way you started, like you know when we say that you know uh, you were talking about how when we were colonized, we were colonized under the hoax of like modernization, like that is what the uh, colonial powers fed to us that we're doing it for the sake of modernization. So, like I recently read about a sociological concept called functionalism. So, I, if I try to draw a parallel between the two, today the dominant sections they are actually doing what uh, what was done to us before under the hoax of modernization, even though it was clear cut exploitation. If you look at it today, so they like kind of treat functionalism as an excuse to. Uh, say like to like trespass merit, merit like meritocracy and and say that you know like oppressive roles exist for a reason and uh they somehow practically try to prove that the present presence of dominant sections even if the dominant sections are like historically advantaged it is necessary like somehow at this point they are better and that you know an oppressive class needs them to come out but they kind of in the same manner, like, you know, uh, before it was like modernization, colonial powers used modernization uh, to exploit, they, they're kind of using functionalism. So it is true, like I, we, nobody can say that, you know, if we uh, like suddenly abolish everything, all the hierarchies and everything, uh, if uh, they are say like they're suddenly just gone and abolished, uh, there would be absolute chaos. So like, how do we kind of, you know, trespass from this functionalism thing? Like, uh, how do we break this into actually, you know, manifesting the truth of what exploitation looks like? Yes, uh, that's fascinating. I, uh, let me just ad admit that I don't fully follow how you're using um, uh, functionalism as the substitute for uh, modernization, but it doesn't matter. The question is clear to me anyway, what you're um, asking. And, um, and I'm going to say something that maybe will shock you a little bit. Um, you know, if we think about, if we go back to the original question in, in jurisprudence, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is law? Why is there law? And when we define what law is, we always associate it to a legal authority, which in our terms today is the state. And so we have to ask ourselves a fundamental political question then, why is there a state? And the answer that is always given and historically given and continues to be given is similar to what you had just said about if we abolish all structures and so on, there will be anarchy or chaos. I'm sorry, you said chaos. Um, uh, what we say in political science or whatever is that without the state, there is anarchy. And so um, you probably have read about in some of your classes uh, social contract theorists who think that we get out of this state of nature by making uh, agreements with one with another and these agreements get enforced by the state and because of the state and the ability to maintain uh, trust contract agreement and so on disc uh, discord get natural discord natural enmity and and uh, chaos and anarchy gets eliminated and justice and order comes uh, uh, comes to to the four. Now that's a traditional thing that we're all taught in numerous ways, not just academically, but even in through social stories, fairy tales, epics, and myths and legends and, and so on. The thing that I want to tell you is what's wrong with chaos? And are we really sure what are the means by which we have to say with certitude that order is better than anarchy. And uh, I ask this uh, as a philosophical question. I don't want to be uh, uh, arrested under NSA or something like this for being <laughs> an anarchist or Naxalite or something. So I ask this academically. Um, we are constantly told that we have to have uh, order and therefore this is what I think you were saying about functionalism. So it, what we hear is may not be the best system, but we have to have a system. If we don't have a system, you're going to have the end of everything. And therefore, we have to tolerate and work within this system. Uh, so we're told this 
in every aspect of life, especially when we're unhappy, disgruntled, treated unjustly. You know, you'll be called in. Maybe you've made trouble at the college and the principal calls you in and says, I understand your problem, but we have, we have to have, you know, rules and etiquette and so on. We'll try to work with you. Now, obviously, so every institution has to do this. Um, but the primary philosophical question is, is order better than chaos? And this is, uh, uh, this has been answered um, uh, more by theology than it has been um, in any other uh, field. So in political science, we just assume the state. Uh, in law, we assume the judiciary and the legal regime. Uh, uh, in sociology, we assume the social order. But the question is, uh, where is the empirical evidence that total revolution is worse than an order, a system of almost chronic and total oppression? And so we have a system of chronic oppression. No one can argue with that. The argument is made that we will slowly move from oppression to liberation. But show me where that's happening. Show me where in the world. On the, on the other hand, we're subject to more surveillance, less freedom, uh, more uh, poverty, less, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we're, we're under lockdown and <laughs> so things are at an extreme right now of, um, of uh, uh, restrictions of freedom of movement and things like this. Um, not saying that's a bad thing. This is a philosophical question. So the, 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 the thing that, that you have to ask yourself philosophically is, am I always going to immediately agree, consent to the principle, which is universal and every institution uses it, that we have to have some order, otherwise there will be chaos. We have to have government, otherwise there will be anarchy. We have to have, therefore, social inequality, otherwise there will be social mayhem and madness. And so as a political philosopher and as father also, when I'm trying to impose my will on my children, for example, I always stop and ask myself, am I not actually just justifying the status quo because of how I am advantaged by that? Uh, so in, the per in parenting, for example, I'll say, well, you have, you know, rules are there for a reason, you have to follow them and so on. If my daughter is, you know, she does crazy things like buys paint and paints the walls and so on. And I get very enraged and I say, no, there must be order. You know, and in this order, I'm the father. That's the patriarch of the family and I make the rules and so on. And the more you understand how what's implied in my claim demand of order, the more you see how I benefit from this order, how, I, how I'm the winner in some ways of this uh, order. And so preaching to the marginalized that you must maintain uh, law, civil standards, um, preaching to um, uh, 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 radical feminists that you must, you should not go out and protest, you shouldn't be disruptive and things like this, um, because we need order, is really a way of um, participating in, can be seen as a way of participating in the exploitative uh, processes. Now, it would be I know there are some faculty members online and so on, so I have to be, I have to be careful and reinforce that I'm not suggesting everyone goes anarchic and crazy and so on. Maintain um, order, actually, but like, um, so, like, but philosophically, you have to be, you have to, you have to press this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So, so like uh, since you're talking about our faculty members, and uh, like recently in one of our philosophy of law lectures, uh, like our teacher Shweta Ma'am, she gave us a very interesting take on anarchy. So, like as as a student, I've only read of anarchy in uh, academic books or novels as something uh, very negative. But like she told us that anarchy is the state of a society being freely constituted without authorities or like a governing body. So it's not, it, it was like, you know, a society that is so free that they don't need authority to, you know, tell them what to do. Like everybody is, has an internal 
morality and i think that some of the scandinavian countries also have judicial systems like that and like you see some not completely never completely can you know this entire thing exist because then you know even if like one country enables this as a regime that that you know we will not have a, a hierarchy or an authority over our people <laughs> probably you know all the criminals in the world would shift to that country and cause me him there so like but like anarchy as a state she told us that it's it's it could also be a positive state yes yeah of course she is she's she's quite correct uh, historically and within the uh, the 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 political and legal theoretical literature as well um there are two things that you mentioned that are interesting one is if this is allowed so there are certain places for example at on the high seas people put a lot of containers and boats together and they have therefore floating land masses that are not subject to any legal regime any states uh, uh sovereignty and uh, and then they'll um develop um their own uh, modes of, uh, of of life without uh, social orders and authorities and so on there's an island uh, between hungary and the czech republic in um in europe that falls uh, between the river that separates these two countries in the no man's land there's a island there that has been taken over by uh, anarchists and um, i visited there um and uh and so they 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 claim to be ruled by no state and um have a completely egalitarian social order and so on the interesting thing is how the hungarians and the czechs send their armies to try to crush places like this and uh basically sovereign states throughout the world do not want to see vacuums of authority and power um they it is a great uh, destabilizing force as you mentioned that maybe criminals and so on will go there i'm more optimistic um i think criminals are largely made by the so the states that um you know they're declared criminal in and so uh um uh you could say uh, asylum seekers are going to these uh, places instead of criminals but anyway um uh it is an urgent need of sovereign states to try to crush the idea of autonomous um uh, uh self governing uh places and you can see that in india as well as uh, as anywhere else uh, order demands uh order and uh, uh and it does so at by any means um and uh, necessary including uh profoundly violent ones but the real question that i was trying to pose to you was um we think that a system of inherent uh, violence and oppression is superior to no system and there is not any empirical evidence for that and so as long as there is not any empirical evidence for that we should really question why we hold that belief and my feeling is we hold my intuition is we hold that belief because we be- we benefit from it and uh as long as we're then benefit then we have to be clear that we're benefiting from an exploitative system um and so you should you know at least become clear in your mind that this is the way that you seem to be approaching a uh, social political and and legal life and probably we all want to take steps to remedy the harm that we that we um cause by by embracing 